It's a very interesting one. Uh, it's about next generation of sustainable infrastructure, empowering in a certain climate future by Heather Morgan. Heather works for ACOM. ACOM is uh, one of the biggest sustainability engineering firms in the world. They, uh, they have more than 90,000 engineers uh, around the world and they try to build uh, climate uh, resilience projects uh, for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yep. Okay, let me just make sure. So, okay, good. All right, so there's a couple things before I get started. Um, so, one with the audience, um, there's two sections kind of this presentation. The first part is my previous past life at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which is a federal agency um, in the U.S. that builds water infrastructure for the nation, does a whole bunch of other things, but it's been around since George Washington and has a huge anthropogenic footprint on the United States. So that's what this front part is. And then it goes into what I currently do now in New York City um, as I work for ACOM. You'll see the interdependencies as I go. So just with a different audience and not necessarily being in the domestic United States, I just wanted to give you that upfront information. So um, when I got hired at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at headquarters, my job was to look at our assets across the country. And I'm just going to run some numbers by you. Um, 700 de uh, 710 dams, um, 460 reservoirs, 15,000 linear miles of levees, 12.5 million acres of recreation, a number of deep draft navigation ports, a uh, number of locks and dams throughout the country, throughout our riverine system. So when you're asked as a landscape architect and an archeologist in a sea of engineers to do a sustainable infrastructure strategy and you've got that much asset that's aging, it's a little, it's a daunting task. So the information I'm gonna show you here is kind of some summaries that came out of it on how to advise the chief of engineers on how to move forward. But this is um, a quote that I often say, if a factory is torn down, but the rationality which it produced it is left standing, then the, the rationality will simply produce another factory. If a revolution destroys a government, but the systematic patterns of thought that produced that government are left intact, then those patterns will repeat themselves. There's so much talk about the system and so little understanding. I think Eileen will appreciate that comment from last night. So this is the ancient courses. It's called the Frisk Maps. They were done in the 1940s from the Mississippi River Commission. And this is a geological study on the lower Mississippi River. So the, gray, the colors that you're seeing there um, are representing millions of years of the rivers, basically patterns for how it distributes itself geomorphologically across the floodplain. So when you look at systems like this and you start to try to understand that this system is massive, it is massive, it's prehistoric, it's ancient, it goes very far back. Um, it's governed by the, national, the natural laws of physics, right? Gravity, water, weight and how it moves and how it bends. So any river potomologist, geomorphologist, anyone's gonna tell you this is a massive system that's lasted and, and worked its way through the terrain for millions of years. At the baseline condition for flood risk management, anyone that performs any type of climate or resiliency in flooding, you are asked to put static measures on this type of dynamic system. Is that sustainable? Ask yourself that. Also, you're often asked based on congressional authorization, your funding, how much money you have, to put single measures on systemic problems. Then you're asked to operate and maintain these assets over a long trajectory of time with life safety being one of the value systems in which you're trying to lower people's level of exposure. And so you have to ask yourself, is this sustainable? So just to do a really clunky thing, I used to put, um, this is Memphis, Tennessee. Um, this is the part of the Mississippi River which goes through it. So to give you an idea of the inhabitation pattern, the natural system that's underneath, that's underneath this, we saw what that looks like and has continued to look like for millions of years. And then earnest little humans and Americans love to inhabit the floodplains, right? Our arterial highways, where we call home, 
where we take our videos, where we have our dogs and our cats, where we have everything that we call life is nested around these water systems. As an archaeologist, I use a term often or a phrase that water is the veins to inhabitation. Um, I think we see that consistently right now. So as I was wading through this process at the core, one of the things I had to start to do was bring the conversation down to something very simple and actually humanize it a lot more in order to get a wide range of um, different disciplines besides engineers to listen to me, to listen to my team. So I used to joke and I used to say, if I was an alien and I came in from outer space and I looked down at the American terrain for water infrastructure, I'd have two questions. Why do you have such a combative relationship with water? You kind of you came from it. A lot of your food table and your water cycle all comes from it. Why do you have this combative relationship? Meaning, why do you build these earthen systems? Why do you do this, da this dam thing, these reservoir things? Why do you have these things, right? And then the second thing is I would say, why do you have such a consumptive relationship with water? So you're, you have, you're combative with it and you're consumptive with it, yet you absolutely need it. And your inter interdependencies for just about every aspect of quality of life is attached to that relationship. So we used to look at this and the other thing we used to say is what you build in water infrastructure is a direct representation of your societal values as a culture. It's just a larger medium. If it is OK to dam a river so you can get more water to, for more people to live maybe where they shouldn't, society made that decision. In the US Army Corps of Engineers conditions, Congress is the only body that can authorize and write that direction and permission to the agency for it to build it. Who elects Congress members? Your votes. You're the congressional constituents. So this all comes back down to what I think everyone's been saying here. Values matter. Words matter. And if you want to change your anthropogenic footprint around water, you have to start using the right words and the right value system to put yourself in a more sustainable place. So let's look at this cross-section. This is New Orleans, right? I'm sure we've all heard some residual relationship with water in New Orleans. So let's look at this. This is a levee system. It has a flood wall along the top of it. Here's your Mississippi River. River. Go back to that Frisk map that I mentioned to you. Here's a house. Look at the relationship from the top of water to the top of the roof. Look at this cross section. They have flood insurance. It's probably national flood insurance, which is flood insurance that's basically funded by the federal government in the, in the states. So here's the thing. The Corps of Engineers has done a tremendous amount in saving lives. A lot of the country has had massive risk reduction over the last 100 years of water infrastructure. The entire country was able to expand westward. That contributed not only to our nation's um, economy, but globally. There's been massive benefits out of the things that the US Army Corps, uh, US Army Corps has built. There's been massive consequences, too and unforeseen consequences and impacts such as this. So when I look at something like this, I try not to point fingers and say, whose idea was this? Because a lot of times it was well intended. But what we really should be saying here is, we can do better than this. This sucks. Come on, that, that sucks. Whether you're in that house or you're just an American watching another hurricane come, right? This, we can do better than this. The United States can do better than this. Any, any of you dealing with these businesses and this type of stuff, we can do better than this. This is the Sacramento River outside Sacramento, California. Think about the Frisk Mac. Look what we did here. We built levees. We built levees. We continue to do land building permits to put up your tax base. How many homes are here? Think about this. You have higher number of rain events, more intense rain events coming more often, hitting into this linear system. What does water do when you put it into a pipe? Does it slow down? No, it speeds up. So you're getting, in climate change and the preci precipitated storm event scenarios, we're getting more rain, we have more people, we continue to build, and yet we're using the same construction detailing for our levee systems. New Orleans, again, levied up on both sides. 
Let's get into the dams. This is out in Los Angeles. This is Whittier Narrows Dam. This is a very flashy flood environment, meaning that a lot of rain comes, the floods come fast, come fast and strong, and they're pretty gone <laughs> after a short amount of time, but they're very, the robustness behind them is intense. Um, 710 dams at the core owns and operates. They also work on Mosul Dam in Iraq. I think we all know the situational awareness there is a very dangerous situation. They created what they call the Dam Safety Action Classification. It's called DSAC. And what that is is a rating system for all the dams in the United States that if you're a one, you have an extremely high probability of failure. If you're a four, you're doing OK. The dam safety program jokes that like fours and fives are unicorns, and they might not really exist. But anyways, this dam is a DSAC one. So what I mentioned earlier, this is a high probability of failure. This dam actually does not retain water behind it, so it doesn't have a reservoir. It's specifically designed for the first fl flush of storm to come from high elevation, skirt through a very highly impervious suburban landscape. Down through here, it gets held and then is let out this outfall. Think about the scales of proportion here. The entire watershed, we're asking this one single measure to absorb the responsibility of everything that you see up here in front of it in its watershed. How many roads do we have outside LA? How many pitched roofs do we have outside LA? Again, a single measure placed in a systems issue, and now every time, every year, it's gaining more and more responsibility. Yet we as a nation are suffering with having enough money to operate and uh, maintain these structures. Oh, wait, residents down on this side. The spillway is over here. It's actually never been um, activated. So Cherry Creek Dam outside Denver, Colorado. This is a DSAC 2. This dam was originally built. Here it is right here. That's the reservoir. Originally built in 1958. It was a dry dam, meaning no water behind it. 12 years later, someone, somewhere, got the idea to want to put water behind it. How many of you have been to Denver, Colorado, right? How quick does the elevation change come, right? Canyon, flashy canyon environment. So let me ask you something. If the reason for this dam, which was built for flood risk, not water supply, 80, like 83% of the dams built for the US Army Corps of Engineers were for flooding. Not recreation, not hydropower, for flooding. And so what happens is the, the storm comes through and it hits this reservoir. If you're in a flashy flood environment, why would you put water behind a dam? If your main objective is to get the water out more slowly so that downtown Denver doesn't get flooded. This spillway right here, built in 1958 with the rest of the dam, it's never been activated. If you go further, there's an arterial highway, there's a bunch of utilities that cross over this spillway, and literally right past the edge of this aerial is a mixed family use complex. The spillway terminates at about a 36 inch culvert with a road on top of it. How is this much water, with a lot more water coming, going to get out that spillway when right now it comes through this outfall right here, this small little outfall? So I had to tell my leadership that the Corps of Engineers, that's our logo, equals static measures on dynamic systems and water landscapes, which equals a creation of landscapes of both benefit, like I mentioned before, but conflict for human inhabitation. So why does it matter? Put up with this for a minute. There's New Orleans right there. We all know that New Orleans is going through a whole scenario of subsidence, which means land is sinking, sea level rise, which is, means the sea is, is raising, right? It's running out of groundwater, a whole host of issues. The entire tidal Martian barrier islands is frag fragmented up by multiple different industries, including the oil and gas. Um, so it's losing a lot of what it's got there. Go further up, you've got Petrochemical Alley, which is one of the largest producers in the world for plastic products. As you move further up, we like to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers tiles the sides of the Mississippi River for erosion and flood. Then as you move up to the Missouri River, which is this river right through here, 
it has a series of dams on it that holds back all the sediment that's needed to actually have a river delta down here. The Missouri River is one of the highest sediment loaded rivers in the United States. So the dams that the Corps of Engineers built up here for flooding holds the sediment which starves the delta which aids in its subsidence. And then if you move up the Kaskaskia River, the Corps of Engineers dug out the center of the Kaskaskia River, the center line of it in the 1930s and again in the 60s for inland navigation, for trade and commerce, for the, basically for the coal industry as well, to barge up and down it. When you cut down the center of a river, when you dig it down, a river naturally, because of gravity again in physics, starts to do this thing where it's called a head cut, where if the spine of the river has been dropped, it starts to dig itself out to get back its original equilibrium. As it digs itself back, it digs up into the tributaries that feed into that river, eroding all the shoreline edges along that. So up in Kaskaskia, we have a large agrarian practices and a lot of chemicals are used in the soil and corn industry. And those chemicals bind to that sediment that gets eroded from the head cut, makes it down all the way through, hangs out and goes through Petrochemical Alley, comes out of New Orleans and ends up in the Gulf of Mexico aiding in the dead zone. That's why it matters that we look at all of these features from an asset management and systems perspective to understand if you're going to do something about any of them, which one do you spend federal dollars for first and why? So I put this in for here for you, Bruce, because you mentioned Mark Twain last night. One who knows the Mississippi River will promptly aver, not out loud to but, but to himself, that 10,000 river commissions with the minds of the world at their back cannot tame that lawless stream, cannot curb or confine it, cannot say to it, go here, go there, make it obey, cannot save shore for which it has sentenced, cannot bar a path with, with an obstruction, which it will not tear down, dance over, and laugh at. Think of the Frisk maps. But a discreet man will not put these things into spoken words, maybe not put them into that many, many billions of dollars in infrastructure. So I had to tell my leadership that what we've done for the last 100 years is not sustainable, even without climate change. So nodding to the Obama administration in 2015, it came out with an executive order. Matt was talking about exec executive orders. The, pro the administration can write an executive order without congressional approval. Unlike this administration, in the past, most presidents would go through a collaborative effort to have many people inform their executive orders and sign off on them besides before they unilaterally pass them. So Obama administration put together the um, 2015 executive order about ma basically managing floodplains. And one of the big considerations in here was requiring that all federal agencies consider sea level rise and community outreach for resiliency in floodplains. The Trump administration came through in August 2017, rescinded Obama's executive order from 2015, which replaced the one from 1977. And in it actually states and resends that all federal agencies are required to look at sea level rise. Embedded down in the document. At Hockley, it's actually not formally named and still has not been given a number. But what it has happened is the recension of Obama's 2015 floodplain management. So I exited federal service. You start to see that FEMA, FEMA's starting to privatize the National Flood Insurance Program, right? The ability for people to still live in floodplains when their house gets damaged by water, you can actually file a claim and, and get repaid or your house can get rebuilt. So you see this coming. Studies are coming out quantitatively, basically backing up what, we've, what I just tried to say in a lot of images. So as I came out of the US Army Corps of Engineers, one of the things I had to do was really kind of stop the greenwashing of the term sustainability and tell resiliency to just park it over there for a minute and basically explain to the people that are trying to robustly get their way out of climate change by being earnestly resilient in unsustainable areas, they need to sit down, zip it, and take notes. Because here's the thing, being resilient in unsustainable places when you have as much of an asset management problem that I showed you up there on the screen in multiple images with high levels of risk, 
It's not wise. You're not only wasting money, you're putting lives at stake, and most importantly, you're wasting time, right? So when we go through this, what we said is we, you, the whole agency needs to recalibrate its view and its value system when it makes infrastructure decisions, when we design new or when we look at old. And that's to be recentered around human well-being, ecosystem integrity, and national security. Risk management, and I already kind of definitely made this point about the whole resiliency thing being the new sustainability thing. Obviously not a fan. So after seven years of long, hard pooling, blood, sweat, and tears, if anyone could just say, Heather, what did you accomplish at the US Army Corps of Engineers? Just, just remember this one line. I am quoting myself in my own presentation <laughs> because it's, I feel it's really important. A lot, of, a lot of time and effort besides me went into this. But this was the line that got my chief of engineers to lean across the table. The health of the natural system is of national secu security concern, period. This made equal table sitting for ecologists, archaeologists, biologists. Sustainability was no longer about the Lorax or you know, running around wanting to protect the environment. It was, how long do you want to stay here with some kind of quality of life? And that if you continue to make uninformed decisions about resiliency, you're, you're basically reducing our, our society's ability to sustain itself. So that was when all of a sudden we were no longer looking at the environmental lens or the green lens, so to speak. I, my office at the core, if anyone put anything green on my desk, I was like, get it out of here. Get it out of here. So what we came down to this, right? No joke, this, big time, this. So I used to tell everyone on the team and everyone in the agencies, because it was not fun to present this presentation or parts of it to the dam safety program, to say, hey, everything that we've built is undermining our envir environmental systems, which basically will allow us not to live here much longer. So I used to say to them, all right, we got to the moon allegedly in nine years, right, for the US, for the US when it came under Kennedy's administration, the moon shot, right? So I always used to tell the engineers, just give me nine years. Give me, just right, starting today, give me nine years. Help me fix that, that ass. just fix one of those dams. Like, can we, can we just make it better, just one of them? Can we redesign one of those levees? Like, we can do this, right? We have the resources. And then the thing about it was make sure that you actually use this as a lens. So since you guys, is, since you guys are from different places than obviously the United States, thank goodness, um, this is your new moon, right? This is your anthropogenically altered new moon. And all of the things that I'm saying here, all of you guys are chipping away at this in different aspects. I just happen to be a nerd about water infrastructure. And so at the end of the day, when we exited the core, we came up, which I think this vision and mission is applicable to all of you guys if, if, if you find it to be an attractive vision and mission. But a nation transformed by a new era of water resources, managed, management driven by the interdependence of human well-being, ecosystems and national security. And that the mission was through learning and adaptation, our company's actions and culture will sustain the intergenerational well-being, preserve the public trust, buy down risks, and invest in, I argued forever to say, informed resilience. And they told me too many words, so we moved it out. I brought Mark Twain back again for you, Bruce, since that's how I know Michael and I'm here. So. So in New York City, um, I currently am um, the lead on redesigning the lower western edge of Manhattan for hurricanes, post-Hurricane Sandy. And my project area right now runs from right about here through this corridor and extends all the way to basically uh, the charging bowl. Battery Park City, just pay attention to this building right here, was completely infilled, 92 acres with excavation from the original World Trade Center, as well as the New York City Harbor for dredging and navigation. Um, once they infilled it, they literally built a city on top of it. It's uh, on the west side of the West Side Highway on the Hudson River side. So for many of you that come to New York City, you get on the Statue of Liberty ferry right there, and then you motor across Statue of Liberty's right over here in Ellis Island. Um, so again, the alignment comes, the flood project is comprehensively this entire project area through here. This is what uh, Wagner Park, which is this feature right here, looks like on a daily basis. 
That's how New Yorkers, they love this public space. We are having to completely redesign it and raise the entire place by 10 feet. So the client is Battery Park City uh, Authority, not New York City. It's a separate intergovernmental agency that reports to the governor, not the mayor of New York. Um, they use their own capital projects money. So if you live in Battery Park City, you pay Battery Park City tax, not New York City tax, even though you're within the boundary of New York City. They have four projects starting. Uh, this one's mine, the South. ACOM put in the bid. We won the North, so we're working on both the North and the South. The Western's about to go out um, later this year. This is an inundation map for a 100-year event in today's conditions. Again, that's the federal standard. It's a low standard. We all know that 100-year storms come a lot more often than 100 years now. Data, for those of you who like numbers more than me talking, um, it is since t between 2010 and 2017, there have been uh, 26 500-year storm events. During Hurricane Harvey a few years ago in Houston, um, USGS, which is our US geological services that put stream gauges and tributaries into major river corridors. They basically, in the stream gauges, it was reported that it was a 1,500 year rain event for over 43 plus hours. So this is what we're dealing with in lower Manhattan this ongoing negotiation between land and water. Topographically, the purple areas is our low point. I'm just trying to move through this fast, because I know I think my time's up. Um, all right, my time's up, okay. So then, sorry, so just know subsurface-wise, we have a relieving platform. You can't put any type of piles through that. I have Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, which is an FDR vehicular underpass that goes through. Um, I also have the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel over here, which is a large tunnel that goes underneath the East River into Brooklyn. I have three subway tunnels and a subway station, and the list goes on. Basically, the flood alignment has to cross through here, cut through here, and go. Right now, it's composed of a lot of different things, deployable flood walls, buried flood wall. We, what's cool about this project is we, we have to integrate every aspect it, into the human well-being and urban fabric. We, none of it can look like you know that the flood alignment's there. It's one of the reasons why I went to work on the project, because of its role in sustainability and not just resilience. Basically, we have to, um, we have to pull together design flood elevations for future storm scenarios. And this is a, basically how we explain it to the public. This is a lot of just imagery from my, our big, large uh, public meetings that we have to have to inform everybody. This is a model. It's, um, I can't animate it on here because it's a PDF. But ultimately, I've shown it to Michael earlier. We publicly show people how far the inundation patterns are going to go in a 100-year event in 2050. So during Q&A, if you want me to run it, it's a minute-long little video. It basically shows you where all the water goes and how severely lower Manhattan gets hit. Um, again, this is how we communicate flooding to the public. And comprehensively, we my job is I explain engineering feasibility and models to the public at a very general level. And one of the things I use as my guiding compass is that I'm not successful if my 10-year-old niece doesn't understand the integrated coastal model when I'm done, um, because she's going to be dealing with this a lot more than me. So these are just pictures of how the design's evolving. Um, this is a new pavilion that's going to be designed as well. Um, and this is just some images from our last public meeting on the new park that will be there with the hidden flood alignment through it. Um, and that's the new pavilion. And hopefully in three years, we're supposed to be ending construction in three years, um, you guys can go out there and see it and be like, hey, I knew the girl that was, you know, <laughs> crazy after this project. So thank you. Well. It's serious engineering stuff, eh? <laughs> I hope you're not very technically bored with that. Uh, so there's a question here. Uh, any possibility there's a collaboration between the United States and EU on knowledge exchange on flood management and relocation? On what exchange? On uh, knowledge exchange. Knowledge exchange of mm. flood management and uh, relocation. Yeah. And uh, are there are real estate companies interested in these scenarios? 
Yeah, so the quick way to answer that is yes. Um, the US Army Corps of Engineers does international agency work, they call it. The dam safety program and the levee safety program, they actually have senior oversight groups that they share as advisor roles with international leaders, um, as well as people in the United States. So there's a whole host of things um, that, that are done to kind of cross-pollinate. We also share flood inundation models and things like that, tools, so that people can start to see what the level of storm's going to be and start to plan into the future. So there's a lot of cross-pollination there. Uh, you, you can show the, the video if you want. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah, if I can hover. Where's the, there it is. OK. So this is, real quick, this is the way this works is you can, the tide is going to be going out twice. So it's going to move in and go out. One of the things people really in New York and the public, I think this couldn't have it made them sad or happy. I couldn't. But basically, this part of um, New York in the year 2050 will have wet feet um, every 12 hours in the tidal cycle. So it does people really good to understand, based on conservative sea level rise numbers, that this area will be wet twice a day, mm -hmm. even without a surge. Um, so go ahead, if we hit play, yeah. that way it rolls. Oops, sorry. And so, um, this does not have rain included in it. It's only coastal surge right now. Eventually, we will have all of it. Um, hover, right, there you go. Yeah. OK, just, it should move. Is it, yep, it's moving. It's just, you can't, can't see it very well. So the water is, a, so what's happening here, this is the Hudson River. And so as it goes through the tidal cycle, that's high tide. Um, I'm totally going to step in that crack. Um, that's high tide, and so the water, we'll see it go in, it will go out. When it comes up through on the second tidal cycle, what you're going to see is you're going to see the coastal surge hit with the high tide, and um, you'll see where the water goes. Again, this is only a 100-year event in 2050. This is not a 500-year event, which is more of the scale of what we're seeing. Um, so if you start to watch down here, you'll see as it hits, it just breaches right through and goes. And so... We use this as a tool to explain to the public the reality of that, what they're dealing with. That, 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 that's why I'm standing in front of them saying things have to change, unfortunately. One thing to pay, very much pay attention to, a lot of time the weathermen like to pay a lot of, you know, and women like to pay a lot of attention to the surge because it's sensational and big and you can touch it. Um, what happens in a lot of these places is once the surge comes through and you have additional rain and wind, you get residual flooding, which is water that stays in after the surge. Residual flooding causes a ton of damage, mm -hmm. highly contaminated water, and it's a very dangerous situation. So the surge, I know, is sensational, but what happens in the residual waters after is, is extremely life-threatening and damaging to communities as well. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, we'll take a short break for a uh, long break for the lunch. Uh, we'll